Hey guys, today we are going to discuss the poem You Laughed and Laughed and Laughed by Gabriel Okora. Gabriel Jibaba Okora, born on April 24, 1921 in Nigeria, was a well-known Nigerian poet and novelist. He made significant contributions to African literature and gained recognition for his novel The Voice. In 1953, he won an award at the Nigerian Festival of Arts and, in 1979, he received the esteemed Commonwealth Poetry Prize. Okora is regarded as one of the pioneers of modern African literature, known for his exceptional writing skills. He explored African religion, folklore and imagery in his works, delving into themes like the clash between African and Western cultures during the time of colonialism and racism. Gabriel Okora's legacy as a talented writer and his exploration of African identity and cultural conflicts continue to captivate readers. He passed away on March 25, 2019, leaving behind a remarkable heritage that has inspired generations of writers and readers. Before we begin reading the poem, let me provide some background. This poem vividly shows how Africans experienced racism and mockery from white people, especially for their songs, dances and spiritual beliefs. An African man is laughed at by a European colonialist who doesn't understand or appreciate the African man's culture and beliefs. The colonialist thinks he is superior and disconnected from nature, while the African community is shown as warm and full of life. In a transformative movement, the white man learns humility and understands the importance of the African connection to the earth. This poem compares two value systems one that dismisses and focuses on intellect and another that is mystical and rooted in inner values. Despite prejudice, the poem encourages communication and understanding between different perspectives. It highlights the significance of respecting diverse cultures and seeking genuine understanding and connection. Now that you have a general idea of what the poem is about, let's read the poem. Note that the poem on my slide has not been divided into stanzas in an attempt to fit the whole poem onto one slide. You laughed and laughed and laughed. In your ears, my song is motor car misfiring, stopping with a choking cough, and you laughed and laughed and laughed. In your eyes, my antenatal walk was inhuman, passing your omniforous understanding, and you laughed and laughed and laughed. You laughed at my song, you laughed at my walk. Then, I danced my magic dance to the rhythm of talking drums pleading, but you shut your eyes and laughed and laughed and laughed. And then, I opened my mystic inside wide, like the sky. Instead, you entered your car and laughed and laughed and laughed. You laughed at my dance, you laughed at my inside. You laughed and laughed and laughed. But your laughter was ice block laughter, and it froze your insight, froze your voice, froze your ears, froze your eyes, and froze your tongue. And now, it's my turn to laugh. But my laughter is not ice block laughter, for I know not cars, know not ice blocks. My laughter is the fire of the eye of the sky, the fire of the earth, the fire of the air, the fire of the seas and the rivers, fishes, animals, trees, and it thought your inside, thought your voice, thought your ears, thought your eyes and thought your tongue. So, a meek wonder held your shadow as you whispered, Why so? 
And I answered, Because my fathers and I are owned by the living warmth of the earth through our naked feet. The poem consists of 10 stanzas of 46 lines. While the language used is not overly complex, it can be a bit overwhelming. Let's make things simpler. Keep in mind that every poem tells a story, and it's important for you to know and understand that story. Let's paraphrase the poem. To you my song is a malfunctioning car, stopping with a sputter and you make fun of me. To you, my walk was unnatural, which your mind didn't understand, and you ridiculed me. You made fun of my song and the way I walked. I danced my captivating dance to the rhythm of the drum, but you looked away and made fun of me. I shared my knowledge of the world far and wide, but you got in your car and made fun of me. You ridiculed my dance and who I am, but the way you make fun of me is cold and it froze your inner being. Now it's my turn to laugh, but I do not do it to make fun of you. That is not who I am. My laughter is the sun, the earth's core, the heat of the air, the sea and all its inhabitants, and it melts away my iceness. Then, you ask me how that is possible, and I tell you, because my fathers and I are owned by the living warmth of the earth through our naked feet. Poetry should never be overcomplicated. Beyond the fancy techniques and poetic devices employed by a poet, what remains is a simple, heartfelt message. I hope the poem makes a bit more sense to you now. When analyzing a poem, an important initial step is examining the vocabulary used. It is your responsibility to ensure that you understand the meaning of all the words used within the context of the poem. To assist you, I have provided a list of words that you may be unfamiliar with. You are welcome to add more words to the list. Misfiring, antenatal, inhumane. Omnivorous, omnivorous understanding, mystic, mystic insight. Ice block laughter, thought, meeked, and note the last word, or not awe. Let's have a quick look at the type and structure of the poem. The poem tells the personal experiences of the speaker, so we call it a lyrical poem. It is written as a funny and critical speech by one character, using free verse. It is also a form of protest poetry, because the poet challenges the idea that Africans are less advanced than white people. The poem aims to help us understand the beliefs, traditions and culture of black people. The poem has 10 sections known as stanzas and each stanza has a different length. It is written in free verse, which means there is no specific pattern or rhyming words. It is written from the perspective of the person speaking. The poet uses a lot of repeating words and phrases, and also lets sentences flow into the next line for a strong and dramatic effect. The last section is written as a conversation between the white person and the speaker, an African, where they directly talk to each other. Every poem has a tone and creates a mood. This poem begins with a mean and hurtful tone. The speaker feels deeply hurt by the disrespect and mocking behavior of the white man towards Africans. The speaker's tone shows pride in their African heritage. Their strong connection to the earth has influenced them to respond in a more natural and respectful way, in contrast to the arrogant and materialistic behavior of the white man. Although the speaker is hurt by the white man's mocking attitude, they choose not to respond with the same level of offensiveness and arrogance. They believe 
that their close connection to the earth and nature prevents them from doing so. The poem ends with a sense of hope, suggesting that reconciliation and transformation can be achieved through proper communication. In the final part of the poem, there is a calm tone as a European becomes humbled by the speaker's warmth, energy and inspirational nature. The poem is titled You Laughed and Laughed and Laughed, although the poet addresses no laughing matter. The title of the poem is powerful because it accurately reflects what the poem is about. The white colonialist or European mocking and humiliating the black speaker. The repetition of the phrase you laughed highlights the cruelty and mockery of the white man towards the African speaker's ways of life and existence. The laughter continues without stopping, as indicated by the repetition in the title. Each repetition intensifies the cruelty, adding more hurt upon hurt. These lines of laughter are the longest in the poem and dominate its structure. However, there is a complete change in attitude when the speaker introduces a thawing effect causing the ice-cold laughter to stop. The repeated use of the title phrase, you laughed and laughed and laughed, emphasizes the humiliation that black people endured under the colonialists. The poem portrays the lives of Africans who faced racism from white people. They were laughed at and mocked for their songs, dances and music, which were their ways of expressing their pain and emotions. White people laughed at the Africans because they lacked understanding or the significance that dancing and singing held for black individuals. There are two main themes evident in the poem, racism and culture. The issue of racism is explored in the poem. The speaker mentions the disgrace of racial intolerance with special reference to how white people mock African people about their music and dance. Cultural differences and the negative effect of the lack of understanding or communication between people are another prominent theme. African culture is mocked and ridiculed by white people who misunderstand their songs and dance. We note that according to the speaker, white people fail to show empathy with the culture of Africans and misunderstand the connection that Africans have with nature. We can also highlight other themes in the poem like communication, materialism, pride, laughter and nature. The poem starts out showing a lack of communication between the black and white people mainly because of the prejudice of the whites. The communication is restored in stanza 9 and 10. The poem also addresses the issue of materialism as demonstrated by the white colonialist. The speaker, an African, is proud of his heritage, which shows us close connection to the earth, thus the theme of pride. Laughter is at the heart of the poem and thus also a theme that runs throughout the poem as a symbol of both mockery by the colonialist and joy and healing by the speaker. Last but not least, we note the theme of nature and its healing qualities as described by the speaker. Now that we have discussed the type, structure, tone, mood, themes and title of the poem, Let's take a closer look by analyzing the poem line by line. Stanza 1, lines 1 to 4. In this stanza, the speaker describes how white people perceive African songs. The sound of the songs is perceived as harsh and loud by the white individuals who do not understand them. To the white people, the songs resemble the noise of a car engine misfiring making an awkward sound. Instead of valuing African culture, they respond by laughing repeatedly. The repetition of laughed and laughed and laughed in the poem 
emphasizes the racial discrimination experienced by black people. The speaker uses a sense of hearing to illustrate how the white man perceives him. The use of your and my in the first line highlights the contrasting interpretations of the African songs by the colonialist and the African people themselves. These songs hold deep meaning within African culture, serving as expressions of their profound emotions and providing up upliftment and encouragement. However, the European person does not recognize these sounds as a song. Instead, they hear harsh and loud noises, considering it as an uneducated voice. The metaphor of a misfiring car is used to describe the unpleasantness of the African song, likening it to the loud popping or cracking sound a car makes when its cylinders do not function properly. This is further emphasized by the reference to a choking cough as a personification. The car metaphor symbolizes the materialistic and technologically driven mindset of the European, reflecting their belief in a modern and supposedly superior world. In contrast, the speaker and the song represent an inferior and underdeveloped world. The last line of the stanza repeats and reinforces the title, with further repetitions throughout the poem. This repetition highlights the increasing build-up of laughter, effectively critiquing and insulting hurtful and arrogant attitude of the white people. Stanza 2, lines 5 to 8. In stanza 2, the African people are seen as less fashionable and modern compared to white people. They are ridiculed for their awkward way of walking, which is likened to the walk of a pregnant woman and considered inhuman. The focus has shifted to the sense of sight, especially how the white person perceives the African's walking style. The metaphor of the antenatal walk compares the clumsy, uncomfortable walk of African people to the walk of a pregnant woman implying an immature and uncivilized manner of walking. Breaking up the words antenatal further emphasizes the sense of something broken or incomplete, creating an image of a person who is not fully developed or considered fully human. This idea is reinforced by the use of the word inhuman, suggesting a lack of normal human qualities. These words reflect the racism and sense of dominance or superiority held by the colonialist. The term passing indicates that the white person openly and indiscriminatingly displays their mocking attitude. The phrase omnivorous understanding refers to the assumption or impression of white people that they fully comprehend African people considering them subhuman, immature or primitive. However, the speaker's use of quotation marks suggests sarcasm, implying that the white people do not truly understand the black people. They only believe they do, while in reality they discriminate against them due to their lack of genuine understanding. Furthermore, the phrase is in quotation marks as it is quoted from an essay by Chenao Achebe, not sure if I pronounced it right, describing the colonialist belief that Europeans are superior and exclusive compared to all other races. This omnivorous understanding devours the identity, culture, humanity and existence of the African man. The words omnivorous understanding in quotation marks can also imply that whites do not really understand the black people. They only think they do. This is a form of sarcasm. The last line directly repeats the final line of the first stanza, 
emphasizing the superior mocking and disdainful thinking, attitude and reaction of the white person. Stanza 3 lines 9 to 10. These two lines highlight how white people mock African people for their singing and walking. The speaker summarizes the first two stanzas where the white person consistently and mockingly laughs at the speaker's song and walking style. The repetition of these summarized lines emphasize the speaker's deep offense towards the white ridicule of him and his people. This mocking and sarcastic laughter disrupts the genuine joy and natural laughter of the speaker. Through this repetition, the poem emphasizes the theme of discrimination and racism, showcasing its negative impact on the targeted individuals. Stanza 4, lines 11 to 14. In this stanza, the speaker states that the African people are made fun of by the white men for their cultural dance, which is described as magical. The white people react by closing their eyes, refusing to look at it. The Africans dance to their own music, following the beat of the talking drums that call out to each other. The word then implies a reaction to the white man's laughter, showing a desire for acceptance and understanding from him. Drums and dancing are important parts of African culture that brings joy and pride. It is seen as a magical experience, representing their inner strength and connection to nature. The rhythm of the drums is personified as if they are talking and pleading. The word pleading emphasizes the speaker's longing to be understood and acknowledged. However, the white people are unable to appreciate the magic of the speaker's dancing to the drum beat. They consider it barbaric and inhuman, closing their eyes to avoid looking at the dancer. This is ironic, because closing their eyes only affects their senses of sight, while they can still hear the beating drums and the movement of the dancer's feet. Once again, the European person burst into uncontrollable laughter, disrespecting and belittling the speaker and their existence. Closing his eyes and mocking laughter are the only response to the speaker's plea to be understood for who they truly are. On to stanza 5, lines 15 to 18. Here, we see the speaker extends an invitation to the white people to embrace the beauty of his world which is described as mystical and magical. However, instead of appreciating the African sky and its wonders, the white people prefer their materialistic world, symbolized by their cars. The phrase, and then, introduces another attempt by the speaker to seek understanding from the European person. This time, the speaker exposes himself even more making himself vulnerable by revealing his inner mystical qualities. These hidden strengths reside deep within his mind and soul. Through his smile, the African culture, with its close connection to nature, is compared to the vastness of the sky. It is limitless and immeasurable, but challenging for others to comprehend. The speaker strives to open the white man's mind to the awe-inspiring wonder of nature, hoping for a deeper understanding of the African people's profound connection to it. Despite the speaker's open heart and soul, the European person closes himself off. He chooses to retreat into his car while continuing to mock and laugh at the speaker. The cause symbolizes the white man's perceived superiority and status in the world. Ironically, he becomes trapped in his own self-centered prison, unable to see beyond the confines of his car or his limited perspective. The laughter 
which mocks the speaker can only be applied to the narrow-minded, self-important European person. Ultimately, he is the one who should be laughed at. And that brings us to stanza 6, lines 19 to 20. You laughed at my dance, you laughed at my insight. The white people laughed at the things that meant the most to the African people, such as their culture and dance. Similar to the third stanza, the speaker summarizes the previous two stanzas, mentioning their dancing and intermersed soul once again. Despite the speaker's effort to make themselves understood by the white man, the white man fails to comprehend the language of the dance and is unable to grasp the speaker's powerful spirit or true essence. All the white man can do is love, revealing their ignorance and lack of understanding. The white European persists in mocking the African people's culture and heritage disregarding everything that makes them unique and defines their true nature. Stanza 7, lines 21 to 25. Hang in there guys, the end is near. In this stanza, the speaker describes the continuous laughter of the white people as icy cold, indicating that their mocking behavior freezes their ability to emphasize with Africans and understand African culture. Line 21 marks the final repetition of the title, highlighting the Europeans' mocking laughter. The word but introduces a change in the poem and a shift in tone. For the first time, the speaker no longer tries to please the white man, but launches an attack on the colonialist, describing them as cold-hearted lifeless and incapable of appreciating the natural beauty around them. The Europeans' laughter turns against them, causing their insight to become frozen. In contrast, the speaker's insight is connected to the openness and freedom of the sky. The white man's insight is confined and restricted, similar to being inside a car. Through metaphor, the white man's laughter is compared to ice blocks that are frozen and lifeless, capable of freezing everything around them. The lack of understanding from the white person regarding the feelings and culture of the black man has led them to lose their ability to feel and observe. Every part of the white man's body that is typically used for communication with others is frozen. Their ears, eyes, tongue, and by implication, their heart or insight. The European is depicted as not fully human, unable to hear, see, or speak. Basic human functions and abilities. Stanza 8, lines 26 to 29. In this stanza, the speaker uses and now to indicate a change. It is now the African people's turn to laugh, but their laughter is different from the mocking laughter of the white people. The speaker has made efforts to communicate with the colonialist, and now they make another attempt to connect. The laughter is genuine and not artificial or cruel like the laughter of the colonialist. The use of a semicolon at the end of line 26 and the word but at the beginning of the next line introduces the description of the speaker's laughter. The speaker's laughter is not cold or unkind. They do not understand the European world of artificiality and unkindness. They are not part of the mechanical and technological world represented by cars and they do not possess a cold-hearted nature that shuts out emotions, kindness, and understanding. Laughter is a natural part of the speaker's tradition. In their oral tradition, laughter is seen as natural and a sign that one finds life meaningful and fulfilling. The cold nature of the European person is completely foreign to them, 
and they are incapable of producing such mocking laughter. The African people are described as more compassionate and stronger than the colonialist. The colonialist, who believes they are superior to the Africans, are out of sync with nature. They have become so dependent on technology that they have lost their sensitivity. According to the author, black people are not materialistic and do not lead luxurious lives. Being closely connected to nature, they still possess warmth and compassion in their hearts. They are not as cold-hearted and self-centered as the white people. Stanza 9, lines 30 to 34. The intensity of African laughter is depicted using natural elements such as fire, sun and water. The speaker describes their laughter as the powerful fire of the sun, emphasizing its intense heat. They use various elements of the earth, both living and non-living, to highlight how their laughter can thaw frozen hearts. The speaker defends their African heritage by comparing it to laughter and the four natural elements, fire, earth, air and water. Fire is a recurring motif, symbolizing the life-giving energy that runs through this stanza. Through metaphors, the speaker compares African laughter to the heat of the sun, which sustains life on earth and to the fire of the earth, representing its life-giving forces. The speaker also compares the laughter to the fire of the air, symbolizing immense power and the ability to bring about change. Furthermore, the speaker likens African laughter to the life-giving power found in various natural elements such as seas, rivers, fishes, animals and trees. This imagery creates a sense of abundance and continuity. By using these metaphors, the speaker emphasizes the close relationship between African people and nature. Their deep connection to the natural elements has shaped their identity and provides them with great joy and fulfillment reflected in their laughter. It is important to note that they see themselves as part of the earth, belonging to nature rather than owning or controlling it. This understanding of their place in the world is fundamental to their identity and contributes to their laughter's profound significance. Lines 35 to 38. The repetition of the word thought in these four lines emphasize the profound impact the speaker has had on the colonialist. Thought means to soften or liquefy by warming and his repetition highlights the transformative effect of the speaker's influence. The symbols mentioned in the first four lines represent the vitality and vastness of the natural world in which the speaker is deeply rooted. The warmth and energy he embodies have finally brought about a change in the relationship between him and the white man. The fire of the speaker's presence has warmed and thawed the senses of the white man. As a result, he can now hear, see and speak with understanding. The African's happiness, rooted in his vibrant connection to the earth, has the power to bring about a transformation in the white man. It softens his heart and grants him insight into the natural world that the black people cherish. The speaker has succeeded in melting the white man's inner being, his voice, ears, eyes and tongue. This signifies a profound change in his psychological attitude, perception and expression. Rather than seeking revenge for the mistreatment and disrespect he endured, the speaker has extended help to the white man. He has restored his humanity and rescued him from a mechanical and narrow way of life and thinking. This significant change feels almost biblical in its magnitude, resembling a transformation only achieved by a divine power. Now let's look at the final stanza, stanza 10, 
lines 39 to 41. In this final stanza, the white man comes to a realization about the worth of African culture. It is as if a battle has taken place, and now the one who was defeated understands the victor and what led to their triumph. The speaker, representing the African people, emerges as the winner. The white man's demeanor becomes gentle and he is filled with awe at the power he has witnessed. The colonizer, once loud and contemptuous, now becomes a silent presence, aware of his impact on the earth and those around him. He may also reflect on the influence of his ancestors and the shadow they have cast. The mocking laughter from earlier stanzas has transformed into a respectful whisper. The white man humbly asks the speaker how it's possible for the Africans to possess such passionate warmth and inner strength, despite being ridiculed by the white people. In the last lines, lines 42 to 46, the two men engage in a real conversation. The speaker explains that the source of his behavior and spirit comes from his ancestors, whom he referred to as his fathers. They draw their energy from the warmth of the earth, which they observe through their bare feet. The speaker attributes their friendly, caring and accommodating nature to Mother Earth. Their close connection with nature, achieved through barefoot contact, with the earth strengthens their bond with the natural world. The colonizer believed that they could forcefully claim and own the land. However, the speaker makes it clear that the land does not belong to anyone. Instead, they and their ancestors are owned by the land. This direct contact with the earth, standing barefoot upon it, is seen as a form of close communication with the earth. It prevents one from having a cold-hearted attitude and instead fills them with a passionate warmth. This warmth not only brings happiness to oneself, but also enables them to positively impact the lives of others. By the end of the poem, the speaker has taught the European the importance of walking upon the earth with naked feet in order to be connected to and owned by the earth. The use of our in the last line now includes both the speaker, his ancestors and the white men, indicating a shared understanding and connection to the earth. The poem titled You Laughed and Laughed and Laughed depicts the interaction between the speaker who represents African culture and a white colonialist who mocks and laughs at the speaker's song, Walk and Dance. The speaker tries to communicate the depth of their culture and connection to nature, but the colonialist remains closed off and continues to laugh. The poem highlights the contrast between the warmth and vibrancy of the speaker's African heritage and the cold materialistic worldview of the colonialist. The repeated laughter symbolizes the mocking and disdainful attitude of the white colonialist towards the African people and their traditions. However, towards the end of the poem, there is a shift in power. The speaker's laughter, described as the fire of the natural elements, melts the frozen heart and perception of the colonialist. The colonialist begins to question and wonder about the reasons behind the speaker's passionate warmth and connection to the earth. Overall, the poem explores themes of cultural identity, discrimination and the transformative power of understanding and connection. It sheds light on the resilience and strength of African culture and challenges the ignorance and arrogance of those who dismiss it. My opinion on the poem is that it effectively conveys the emotional impact of racism and cultural misunderstanding. The use of repetition and metaphors adds depth and intensity to the poem's message. It serves as a powerful reminder 
of the importance of respecting and appreciating diverse cultures and seeking genuine understanding and connection. I conclude with a quote from Robert Allen, Cultural differences should not separate us from each other, but rather cultural diversity brings a collective strength that can benefit all of humanity. I hope my explanation helped you gain insight and understanding of this poem. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask. Cheers.